Okay, can I please ask everyone to take their seats so we can begin this final session? Start. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome back to the final session of our seventh conference. Uh, the three presentations this afternoon will be following the same theme of our conference on changes and reshaping higher education. I'd like to introduce David Turvey, the Acting Commissioner, Jobs and Skills Australia, who will be talking skills for the future, what the data tells us. David. Well, thank you very much. No, I can't decide whether to put my glasses on. Oh, yes, I need my glasses. Uh, thank you very much for having me with you this afternoon. Um, it's great to be back at this conference again. I was here last year and it was a fabulous event. Looks like you've had a great time again um, this year. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on this afternoon before I get into my remarks and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about um, actually kind of slightly broader than the topic, uh, how, how do we blow up the entire education system? Um, and really my pitch is gonna be around, how do we think about the kind of the supply of labor? I mean, very much focused on um, labor because I work for Jobs and Skills Australia. So uh, how do we think about the sources of labor supply in a kind of joined up and, cons and consistent way, which I don't think has really been the case um, uh, all that much recently. So what I'm going to do is um, talk a little bit about current labour market and skill shortages and then some projections of future employment growth, um, doing a little bit of a deep dive into the clean energy um, sector because we've just done a big report on that. Um, but I think it's illustrative of the points I want to make. Um, and then I want to kind of finish with this idea of a joined up roadmap for the jobs and skills system. So let's see if I can get this thing to work. Uh, did that move? No, it didn't move. I didn't push it hard enough. Oh, there it goes. Got to really push it. Okay, so in terms of skill shortage, so to, just to sort of set the context, obviously you would know that the um, labour market has been stupidly tight, right? So the last couple of years post-COVID, um, the labour market has been as strong as it's been in 50 years. Unemployment rate, 50-year lows. Uh, underemployment's fallen. The participation rate has gone up significantly, including for women, um, more so than for men. And I guess we've all been expecting that to kind of ease as the um, as monetary policy tightens and, and as the economy slows in response. And we're now sort of starting to see some clear signs of that. So it's my strong expectation that we will see monetary policy ease um, the, um, the, the kind of labour supply. Am I going to get any instructions about how to do this? No, you're going to do it for me? No? <laughs> okay. I, I need it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Good. Excellent. Um, so um, I'm not sure how I'm going to get on to the next slide then. Can you click that while you're walking down? Oh, good job. Okay. Um, so labour market is going to soften. But for the time being, what we're seeing in our analysis of skill shortages is, is that there's, there's still a lot of them. And, um, and we do this analysis by looking at uh, what employers actually do when they're recruiting. So we survey around 9,000 businesses every year. Um, we ask them whether or not, when they do a recruitment effort, whether or not they found um, somebody, and if, if they didn't, you know, the reasons why they didn't. We then use uh, an econometric model to estimate the likelihood of job being filled, and we test that against extensive stakeholder feedback from, from industry. And, and the conclusion from that this year, we released this res um, these results about a month ago, around a third of occupations um, in the labour market currently are in shortage. And that's up a little bit from last year. Um, and last year was a significant jump up from the year before. Uh, and that reflects that tightness of the labour market. Even though things are starting to ease a little bit off now, um, it's, you know, there's pent up demand in the labour market. It's taking a long time um, for these vacancies to clear. And for a lot of the occupations that we look at, there is um, uh, you know, a long training pathway to get people into work. So, um, you know, thanks, Matt, yes. um, so, so we still have this sort of you know, significant shortages in the labour market. Um, in terms of where that shows up and what kind of jobs we think are most in demand, um, it was really the professionals category that jumped um, most this year. There was a big jump again last year that's gone up even further this year. Um, and what we're now seeing is that almost half of the professional occupations that we cover are in shortage currently. 
uh, and um, half of the technical and trades occupations. Some of these categories, like every single occupation in, in that, uh, particularly in some of the trades occupations are in shortage. Um, and, and this is a sort of binary assessment, occupations in shortage or it's not. Uh, but if you look at the, the largest employing occupations, things like age and disabled carers, retail managers, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, um, yeah, a large chunk of these occupations that are significant employers in the labour market are all in shortage. So, um, so it has a significant impact on, on the way the labour market's working. And interestingly, persistence, right? So these occupations are in shortage every, every year, um, which is a worry. Think about Asian disabled carers or electricians. Um, they've been in shortage every year we've done this assessment. Uh, one thing I didn't put on this chart, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a complicated story to tell, but the analysis we've been doing around these skill shortages, uh, we've been looking at it from a gender perspective. And what we've been finding is that uh, if the occupations have got a highly gender skewed workforce, they're much more likely to be in shortage. So around a bit over half of the male dominated occupations in the labour market are in shortage. About 40% of female dominated occupations are in shortage compared to sort of 25% for everything else. So basically, if you're kind of not looking at half the population, you're much more likely to have trouble finding workers. Kind of a no brainer really. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting that that sort of that hasn't really kind of come through in the way employers are doing recruiting. Um, what we've been trying to understand, though, is why? Like, why are we having these shortages? And uh, I think one of the, for, for, for policy and for the way this sort of analysis is used to inform policy, um, just the fact that an occupation's in shortage should not automatically mean that we've put more funding into the training system or bring more migrants into the country. And the reason it, uh, is that not all um, shortages are caused by the same thing. And so what we've done here is tried to categorise the different types of shortages that we're seeing in the labour market. And so on the left-hand side there, you're seeing the kind of the traditional sort of occupations where um, it is actually just that they're, and this is based on data analysis, it's, both, it's, it's the number of applications that are applying for the job where the applicants have um, the right qualifications to do the job. And on the left-hand side, that is generally there just aren't enough qualified people applying for the jobs. And the difference between the top and the bottom is how long it takes to train somebody. Um, so in the top, we're talking about things like early childhood education teachers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, electricians, where it takes a, it takes a good couple of years to train the people. In the, the bottom, um, what we call the shorter training gap category, uh, uh, um, uh, Cert 3 and below uh, pathway occupations. So, so that side of the equation uh, is where putting more people through the education training system will help. The other side is uh, a whole different story. So here we've got, uh, I'm going to start at the bottom and then go up. The group that we've called suitability gap here is where we've got sufficient numbers of qualified applicants applying for the job, but employers aren't hiring them. So that means that Either they're not learning the right things in their formal education, um, or employers are looking for something broader, some you know, employability skills, soft skills, you know, other types of things that uh, are important in the labour market. And, and some of the occupations in that group are um, construction managers, um, advertising marketing professionals, engineers, civil engineers are in that group. So, so people are not learning something in the education training system, so there's something about what they're being taught in the curriculum, or there's something about the, the other employability skills that they need that they're not getting in the formal education system. And then finally, we've got this other one, which we call the retention gap, which is where um, there's actually just people leave the job. And, um, and this is based on data that shows very high churn, high turnover in the occupations. And so um, basically the conclusion here is that the jobs aren't very attractive. Um, so something about remuneration, something about working conditions, might be bullying and harassment. Um, and, um, and in this group, we have things like um, aged and disabled carers, child carers, human resource professionals and chefs. So here it's, it's actually job design that's the problem. Um, so I guess I just wanted to kind of leave you with that idea that you know, in order to have policy, good policy in uh, helping fix these skill shortages, it's not just rush straight into pumping more people through the training system. So to then start to look ahead, um, we, 
we obviously we do projections of future employment growth and um, where we think the jobs might be in the future. Um, these are possibly more helpful for um, directing funding in the education training system, although, as you know, projections are almost always wrong. Um, but uh, I'm not allowed to say that out loud. Um, so, so the projections I want to show you now, essentially we anchor our projections in the Treasury's official forecast for employment growth. Um, so over the next 10 years, we're expecting about, about a 15% increase in employ total employment. And in terms of the structure of the economy, we've had these long-term shifts in the structure of the economy, largely towards services, and, and they're going to continue. So the top three industries in terms of expected future employment growth, uh, healthcare and social assistance, uh, professional scientific and technical services, and education and training. Um, interestingly, for the first time in a long time that I've been doing this sort of work, we're actually projecting an increase in the share of employment in the economy in manufacturing. Manufacturing's had a long-term downward trend, um, possibly because of automation and various other things, uh, but we're actually seeing a pickup in manufacturing uh, employment which we think is probably driven by the impact of COVID and the, the sort of fragility of supply chains and people wanting to bring uh, a bit more of the production onshore. In terms of the occupational groupings, it's clearly professionals. Professionals is driving things very strongly, um, uh, although you know, the management group's um, important there. But the one kind of point I wanted to leave you with, with this sort of slightly complicated chart, is the skill level point, right? So we, we use the ABS's um, occupational codes and they've each got a skill level attached to them and the skill level relates to what kind of education you had to do to get that job. And so skill level one is a bachelor and above. And so what we're seeing in these projections is 92% uh, of all jobs in the next 10 years will require a post-school pathway. 48% of those, I think, is in uh, higher ed, uh, and about 45% is in vocational education. So almost half-half in the post-school, higher education and vocational education. So the minister I report to, Minister O'Connor, looks after skills and training policy, likes me saying that. Uh, the vocational education policy is, uh, system is as important to the labour market as the higher education system. Um, and uh, that's... Um, this chart, so a slightly complicated chart, um, this actually shows that um, what we've seen over the last sort of couple of decades is this sort of trend towards more younger people having higher level qualifications. And so if you think about that, that need to get sort of 92% of new jobs with, with post-school qualifications, part of that's going to happen kind of automatically as old, older people move out of the labour market and, and younger people who've, um, who traditionally have more of those higher level qualifications are moving in. So we're going to naturally get this sort of movement towards a higher, uh, higher more highly educated workforce. Having said that, um, we're a bit away at the moment. So at the moment, around 70% of workers have got a post-school qualification. So there's still um, a bit of work to go to get to where we think we're going to be in the future. In terms of kind of the overall driving trends, the, the kind of the mega trends, if you like, um, in, we published a report recently where we talked about three main um, things, which are um, the shift to care and, and services, and you've seen that in the earlier projections. Uh, the, uh, the second is digital and the digitisation of, of skills, and the third is the shift to clean energy. So these are kind of three core things. The, the digital one doesn't tend to show up in the projection so much, and that's because digital skills are down in everything. Uh, so we no longer talk about IT jobs or tech jobs. Digital skills are ubiquitous and they're in um, pretty much everything we see. But I did want to kind of dive into the, the mega trend around the clean energy um, story a little bit because I think this helps illu uh, illuminate this story around um, a, a more joined up approach to the way the education and training system supports the labour market. So we published a report recently called The Clean Energy Generation. We thought that was a very cute title. Um, and it basically says, uh, what, what are we going to need in terms of workforce to, to deliver on a zero carbon economy by 2050? And the first thing we did was try and define what the workforce is, because strangely enough, there wasn't a kind of agreed definition of what a clean energy workforce looks like. So we scoured the entire economy and we found the occupations that we think are most relevant to the transition to net zero and we put them into these groupings, um, which go from the actual production of energy itself to distribution all the way through to the transitioning uh, industries, the ones that will be kind of um, winding down. And we've identified 38 occupations that we think are going to be critical for the clean energy transition. 
and they include some traditional occupations that are just going to have more demand. Electricians, electrical engineers are the obvious ones. But there's a whole bunch of jobs that are changing in nature, and like mechanics is a good one. Mechanics are um, needing to learn to, to work on electronic vehicles. Um, so they're, they're, it's the same job, but the nature of the job's changing. And then we've got emerging occupations, things like wind turbine technicians, energy efficiency auditors. These are not occupations that existed five years ago, 10 years ago. And interestingly enough, then we found a range of related occupations um, where uh, that are going to be critical, and university lecturers and vet teachers are included in that category because we need people to teach the people to do these jobs in the future. And then we need some projections, so we said, okay, how many more of these people are going to need? We think we're going to need 500,000 of them over the next 25 years. So this is a big ask. Um, stronger growth for these occupations than the economy as a whole, and, um, and some kind of uh, interesting concentration. So what, um, you know, electricians. So we think we need another 32,000 electricians in the next seven years alone, um, which has got the elect uh, electricians, uh, the, the electoral sector kind of worried. Um, partly because what we're seeing in this analysis, we did projections of demand, but also likely future supply. And for some of these occupations, the likely future supply is nowhere near what we think demand will be, and electricians is in that category. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, and you kind of can't really see it, you can see it a little bit in the shape of this chart, but uh, a lot of the growth is actually in the next 10 years. And that's because uh, a big part of this transition is actually um, capital uh, renewal and construction. So we're building an, uh, an electric uh, energy system, and that means replacing a whole bunch of capital. So in the next 10 years, we're going to need heaps of electricians, we're going to need heaps of construction managers and um, project managers and, um, and that will be an important story for the next decade. But once we get to the, that sort of recapitalisation, the employment impacts sort of flatten out a little bit. We think that clean energy generation will actually be less labour intensive in 10 or 15 years than it is now. Um, so there is a kind of a profile in this. But then we looked at where are these people going to come from? How are we going to train them? Um, where are they going to get their skills? And we, and we decided that, they, that there's a sort of existing broad base of qualifications and dual qualifications that will continue to be important. We'll need top-ups, micro-credentials, electives, and then we'll need some genuinely new um, qualifications. And because this is an emerging industry, you know, industry or, or area of the labour market, it's, it's interesting that we are finding these innovations in the way education training is delivered. And, and we think this is possibly a good um, possible test case model and that might be replicated across the rest of the labour market. So there's some really great examples. AI Group um, is piloting an electrical degree and Cert 3 in electrical trades delivered as an apprenticeship. Um, we've got theoretical knowledge from the higher education system and the practical skills from VET, vet being taught together. Um, Federation Uni are planning to do something similar, six-year apprenticeship um, with a Cert 3 and an electrical engineering degree. We've got um, Chisholm Institute partnering with an with a, um, energy generation and battery storage company to, to run a program that bridges the gap between a kind of trade qual and a four-year engineering degree. Um, and, um, and we've got kind of, you know, a range of these other new models. Now, this is really going to challenge the regulatory framework, right? So courses are regulated differently, they're funded differently. Um, states decide who gets to be an apprentice. So there's, a, there's, there's big challenges in the way this is going to roll out, but there is innovation happening. And I guess what we'd like to see is some of that innovation kind of being used as a model that could be applied in other parts of the labour market. And so the conclusion of this report, we made a range of recommendations and suggested that you know, the workforce shouldn't be a barrier to the transition to net zero. We should make sure that that doesn't happen and that the transition should be inclusive, uh, that should bring in people that traditionally been excluded from the labour market and that it should be very much place-based and, and, and regionally directed because the, you know, the transition, interestingly, a lot of the, the transitions, um, the declining industries and the new industries are in roughly similar places. So there's a genuine um, place-based approach to the transition. Um, but we did make some um, potentially controversial recommendations, things like giving TAFEs the right to self-accredit some of their courses, um, uh, some suggestions around how we can bring more apprentices into the system, and ideas to promote, um, you know, bringing international experience to Australia. And of course, because we love data, we ask for more data. So let's, you know, let's have some more data. Uh, so I wanted to kind of just 
just, just leave those examples with you as a way to think possibly a bit differently about how the education and training system can be better joined up to deliver the jobs that we're going to need in the future. And I want to just talk for a few minutes before I take some questions about this idea of a, a jobs and skills roadmap. We published a paper called Towards a Jobs and Skills Roadmap about a month ago. And, um, and it's, it's really because our vision at Jobs and Skills Australia is to, is to realise the full skills potential of Australia in order to maximise productivity, anticipation and wages and equity, right? And so now, I think, uh, is probably the best time in, in my career to try and realise that. I mean, we, you heard this morning about the University's Accord and, and those discussions. The, the Commonwealth and the states and territories have just agreed a new nat national funding agreement for the vocational education system, and there's a range of reforms being implemented there, um, both in the way um, products are regulated, but also how they're developed. And then the other part of the story here is the migration strategy. So government's been working on a new migration strategy. They'll be releasing something soon. All of these three systems are all key components of the sources of labour supply that we're going to need for the future of work, for the future of jobs. Um, interestingly enough, in the past, policy settings have not been done together. They've been done very separately. So what we're trying to do at Jobs and Skills Australia is look at how these systems can work better together. So the kind of analysis I've shown you today, assessment to the current state of the labour market, changes in future job growth, um, changing nature of jobs, um, and, and analysis that we've done around how well the, the vocational education and higher education systems are performing to meet the needs of the future are all kind of critical to um, delivering on a more joined up um, approach. And I just wanted to show you this, um, this very text heavy, you probably can't see it, um, but what we did in this report a few weeks ago was identified uh, a range of potential things that we could be working on in partnership with you all and, and our partners, the tripartite partners that help us do our work um, to, to help improve the national skill system. And um, this is just a selection of the ideas of things that we're thinking about doing. One that I particularly wanted to point out was number 10, for those of you who can read this, um, which is the idea of a national skills taxonomy. Um, now, for those of you who were here last year, you would have heard me talk about um, some work that we've been doing in this space. But the idea here is to try and come up with a common language of skills different from occupations, different from qualifications, but the actual skills, the skills that employers need to have in a job. And at the moment, there is no clear language. There's, there's lots of classification frameworks, there's lots of, um, uh, of ideas around this, but there's no single national framework that, uh, that has a common language that can be used across both that and higher ed and the labour market to help people do the right courses for the right jobs. And so we'll be embarking on a project to build that and we'll be coming out to talk to people like you about how we might do that going forward. Um, so really that's where I wanted to leave um, my presentation. I think, as I said, um, big changes in the labour market, big changes in the economy, that, that will need big changes in the way we think about the education and training system and about how we knit together the different sources of labour supply and the systems that will be um, critical to giving us the people that we need do the jobs that we'll need in the future. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. We have some few minutes for questions. So do we have any questions for David? Thank you. Hello, um, Kaushik from RMIT University Student Union, also the international officer at NUS. Um, my question is regarding the skill shortage thing. So for skill shortage, what do you think is the main reason? Um, so do you look at skill shortage from a perspective that it's a better opportunity for recent uni graduates to come out and get jobs straight away? Or do you look at it as a failure of the education system in terms of not um, producing enough skilled workers in the country? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Thank you for that. Um, I, I guess what we'd like to see is, so obviously the labour market, sometimes it's tired and sometimes it's weak. You know, sometimes unemployment's low, sometimes it's high. Um, but what we really want is, regardless of whatever that situation might be, the process of matching people with jobs is working as well as it can. And so you know, this sort of the idea that there's skill shortages 
in a time of tight labour market. It's not that surprising because there's lots of demand and not enough people to fill the jobs. But if, as we expect, you know, the labour market softens, um, uh, we, uh, you know, it's likely that um, skill shortages will ease. But we really want that matching process to work as well as possible at any given point in the labour market cycle. And I think the, the point I was trying to make with the presentation is that the causes of those shortages can vary. And so obviously some, when the labour market's tight, there's more opportunities for young people or recent graduates to get into the labour market. Um, but we want, we want those sort of problems that I talked about in terms of job design or the way the education training system's training people for jobs. We want to try and resolve those problems at any point in the cycle so that people have got the best chance they have of getting into work no matter how tight the labour market is. Thank you. Next question. This one here. Simon Buckham Shum from UTS. Um, with a national skills taxonomy in place, can you paint the vision for what that then enables? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, in fact, what we're going to do with this, um, the design of the national skills taxonomy is come out and ask people like you what you think it could do. Um, uh, because we've had a crack at this in the past and we're not quite sure we've hit the mark. And so we'd like to go back to first principles. I think for me, when I think about it, I mean, the government's announced its intention to, to develop a, um, a skills passport. So kind of a place that, that people can sort of um, post their credentials in a way that will help employers understand what, what job seekers um, have done and, and know. The thing I'm worried about is that uh, employers use a language when they talk about their jobs. Education and training providers use a different language when they talk about what they're teaching. And in the, in the VET system, it's very, very heavily prescribed in training packages. In the higher education system, it varies from course to course through curricula. So there's really kind of no common way of talking about what people have actually, what they can do as a consequence of the, the training they've done and the work that they've done. So what we'd like to get, what we'd like to get to is a point where there's a common language that people can use to describe what their skills are in a way that employers will understand and that uh, education training providers can, can use to design the courses that they teach. So that process of getting people into jobs is made better because everybody's talking the same language. Thank you. Do we have any questions over this side? Hello. Sorry. Up the back. <laughs> okay. I'll just get this one and we'll send the microphone up the back. Here, Amelia. Hi, Sally Mayo, um, Engineering at IT, University of Melbourne. I was interested in your comment about the civil engineers in particular, but it applies to the other professions where you had the bottom right quadrant, the people apparently applying for the jobs in large numbers and the employer's needs not being met. Are you investigating the reasons that the employers uh, provide? Can you? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we are. And I mean, that's, this is a kind of key priority for us to understand what's going on here um, and talking to obviously the engineering profession about those occupations in particular. So, so I guess in principle, it, it's, and as I said, one of two things. It's likely either, um, you know, soft skills, employability skills, um, those sorts of things that aren't traditionally part of education curricula, um, or it's something to do with the, um, the technical skills people are, work, are learning. So that goes to how well the industry and what employer needs is, is being fed back into the education and training system. Obviously in the vocational education system, there's very um, rigorous uh, processes for that. In the, in, the in the higher education system, it's possibly a little bit less structured. Um, and then the, the sort of third part of the story is the whole kind of work integrated learning kind of concept and you know, getting people work experience while they're studying so that they're getting a bit of both of those skills. So there's a range of different things that we think might be at play here. And I think it, it does vary by occupation, which is why we're talking to each of the, the uh, occupational groups separately. Thank you. Thank you. The question up the back, yes. Do you have a microphone? Yes. Good. <laughs> um, hello, my name's Aurelia Eves. I'm a student representative from the University of Southern Queensland. Um, from your analysis, 
you described higher level qualifications and professions and trades yeah. being um, what's in demand. People are, need these higher level qualifications to get into professions and trades, but generally it takes years. Um, and I would like, I didn't see anything in the slides to represent something from my experience is that how does a person take three years out of their lives to support themselves to study and also um, older people we're an aging society and i've just finished my studies at 50 and i feel energized and ready for a whole career in it and yet everything seems to be that it's all about young people but in an aging society you need to have um, systems in place where people can come into professions especially women in teaching and nursing um, and can afford to to live their lives while they're getting these higher level qualifications that they need to be a professional because from my perspective we want to do it we want to um, i sold my house so that i could study i shouldn't have to do that um, and that's where we're at in society now education is there's barriers and finance is the biggest one because there are a lot of older Australians who want to fill these gaps, but we can't. Um. <laughs> you have a response? Well, I have a yeah, look, look, they're all um, really great points. And I, it was actually at a... Um, a meeting this morning, I'm on the board of the National Careers Institute and where we were talking about how we can support older workers back into the workforce. It's a, it's a very uh, important topic and one that the uh, government's actively thinking about how better to support people with information about career prospects and, and supports and to get back into the labour market. Uh, and, the, and the point about the, um, the, the cost of training and, and being out of work, as, there's, there's been an active discussion as part of the employment white paper process around paid work placements and how to get people into a work experience while they're studying and, and, and try and overcome some of those financial barriers. So I haven't got any answers for you other than that it is actually an active um, consideration of both those topics in government at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we're out of time. If anybody has any further question for David, you could take them up with him at the drinks after this session. I'd now like to <laughs> thank David. Thanks, David. Hey. Our next speaker really needs no introduction. I'm sure you all know Lisa. Lisa Bolton, Director of Quilt Research and Strategy, the Social Research Centre. And Lisa will be talking about the latest insights from Quilt with a focus on student employability data. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I need to get my hair updated on that photo. Um, thanks, everyone. Hi. As we said, today I'm going to be talking about graduate employability. I've put it in inverted commas because to some degree I'm going to talk about um, the current graduate outcomes. I'm going to talk about international and domestic students. I'm going to talk a little tiny bit about the employer survey and some considerations we might need to make um, with the quilt surveys going forward. So as you all know, I think, there's the Student Experience Survey, which is um, of current undergrad, postgrad coursework students uh, onshore. We have the GOSS, which is collected three years after, oh no, which is collected four to six months after students have completed their program. The GOSS Longitudinal, which we follow them up about three years later. And the one I consider our problem child, the Employer Satisfaction Survey, where we actually survey the actual um, supervisors of our graduates, uh, which is fabulous methodology. 
hard to do. Um, so today I'll mainly be focusing on the graduate outcome survey. And so I was just going to talk a little bit about who are our graduates. The largest study areas that we look at are in business and management, teacher education, humanities, culture and social science, nursing, science and maths, health services and support. There are 21 study areas that have been decided by someone in the midst of time. Um, and there are some that are tiny, medicine, rehab, veterinary science, dentistry. They're tiny, tiny areas, very high employment rates. So when you're listing a list of high employment outcomes, they always figure greatly, but in fact, they only make up a very small proportion of our graduates. Nursing and teaching are big ones, and they tend to be fairly vocationally focused, engineering as well. But science and mathematics, uh, humanities, culture and social science, business and management, are fairly generic courses and they don't have a clear um, and unambiguous career outcome. You don't go, oh, I did business and management and now I'm a business and manager. It doesn't quite work like that. It's, 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 it's a more art than science. Um, international students are much more clustered really in business and management, computing and information systems, nursing, and science and mathematics if we take them all. Um, and they're clustered mainly in the postgrad research area, those science and maths international students. Now this said, did a bit of a paper with um, the deans of agriculture. Agriculture sits in some institutions in veterinary science, there's animal husbandry. In business, there's agribusiness. In science and mathematics, because there's a bit of science, and in agriculture. And so when institutions are looking at allocating ASCED codes to individual courses, there's a problem where courses with almost the same name are actually included in different ASCED codes, which puts them different study areas. So the opportunities for benchmarking become much more problematic. So there are data quality issues, and I'm going to come back to this theme. There may be, if I have a theme, this is one of my themes. There's a data quality issues about the way that institutions are accrediting programs and into what ASCED codes they put them. Um, in terms of gender, we've got females accounting for 62% of the responses to the um, graduate outcome survey. That's a little over uh, represented, so males are less likely to respond to surveys, um, but effectively that's how the sample looks. There are more females in higher education than males. The other areas that we look at, we look at all the equity groups, and again, I'll talk about data quality issues. Say we're looking at disability. How are institutions collecting that data? When are they collecting it? When do they update it? What do they consider a disability to be? And there are differences in how institutions are doing that, how they're recording it, and how they put it into, God bless it, taxi. That small titter of discomfort. Um, study mode was our big problem with the SES, especially during COVID, where we discovered that institutions were putting that data into, uh, into the systems in very unique and, and exciting ways. Um, uh, even uh, ATT, uh, 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 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander or Indigenous category, um, I've seen a number of people born in China, and I don't want to imply that they may not identify, but I, I worry that there may be some data quality issues in there that institutions are not picking up. We have the same problem in a number of these areas. First, in family, is diabolical. It's actually measuring parental attainment, not first in family, and it's collected at first enrolment. Locality, regional, rural, remote, there are similar issues in the data quality where we're collecting it at a particular time. We're assuming that that student coming in is in their home address from when they grew up with mum and dad. There are a whole pile of issues about the data that we're going to be using through these quilt surveys to support what we're doing around the accord. And I think that it behooves institutions to be thinking about this, looking at how they're recording this information and putting it in taxi. And I think there's a sector issue about making sure that we have agreed definitions for these things not just for taxi and the government, but for our own benefits, so that we are, when we're looking at sort of graduate outcomes for regional and rural students, for example, we know who they are, and we know that we're measuring it in the same way as other institutions. So 
she says. And then citizenship, um, international students, graduates makes up currently 28 per cent of our responses. We're probably seeing still that dip post-COVID. That'll probably increase. Um, China, Nepal and India make up nearly 70 per cent of those responses. Um, and about 10 institutions make up more than half. So they're very clustered, the international students, and they're coming from particular countries and they're clustered quite a bit into study areas. This is. So what happened in 2022? I like the whole rising tide floats all boats. As David was saying, we had a big increase in, in um, full-time employment rates, particularly for undergrad students. It was exciting. It's like when COVID hit and the SES went up. Oh, that little, oh, something to talk about. Um, so that the, the, the full-time employment rate shot up by nearly like nine, 0.6 percentage points for undergrads. Less, um, less of a, a, a rise, but still a rise for postgrad coursework, postgrad research, because they were usually already attached to the labour market. So undergrads, really the big rise was undergrads sort of accessing the labour market for the first time, more so than students who were already in the labour market. Uh, and we know that postgrad coursework students are more likely to have already been in the labour market. Um, we, we rose all boats, but the poor international students are still about 10 foot underwater. So we see that um, for international students, their full-time employment rates are and remain substantially lower than for domestic students. At the undergrad level, excitingly lower for postgrad coursework and um, a little bit lower for postgrad research. Now, postgrad coursework, domestic enrolments are a tricky beast because there's a lot of people who've been working for quite a long time returning to the workforce and doing a post-grade qualification, your MBAs, those kinds of people. And they force up those full-time employment rates because they're already working full-time, more likely to be online students, more likely to be um, usually working full-time, etc. So the institutions that talk about we are the highest um, full-time employment rate in the country some of that is to do with where their students are already at before they start their course. Um, and what we also see is those postgrad coursework international students are not doing much better in the employment market as undergrad. So there doesn't appear to be an employment premium uh, really for those international students who've done a postgrad coursework qual compared to an undergrad qual. Some of that study level, some of that um, study area. Oh, I didn't think that was going to work for a minute. Thought I'd do the pay gap because Justine got excited. So I've whacked in the gender pay gap, and you'll see that there is a small gender pay gap. Well, there is one though for undergrad that persists and has persisted for many years. But you can see that that gap for postgrad coursework students is actually quite a bit bigger than it is for undergrad, and it's less again at postgrad research. Aha, uh -huh, I say I do have a reason for this. So I've got a quote here from WGEA. Um, the gender gap pay favours men exists in every age group. Sorry, my reading skills are poor. Um, it shows that the gender pay gaps 2.5% for employees under 24 years old increases at a constant rate before peaking at over 30%, an earnings difference of over 40,000 per year for employers aged 45 to 64. Tragically, that's me. Um, so we've got here, if we control for age and we just look at students under 30, so no other filtering, you see that pay gap for postgrad coursework comes right down. It's not so much an artefact of the study areas the students are doing, it's not necessary, it still exists, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but once you take out that time in the labour market, that, that gap starts to, to, to get quite a bit smaller. We controlled for first full-time job, a few other things, but in fact age was the bigger, the bigger difference. It's time in the labour market. I am jumping quickly. <laughs> um, so in terms of what employability, in inverted commas, I thought I'd tell you what the employer said, because we still have a lot of skills questions in that employer survey. There's about 500 of them, many of which may or may not be particularly clear. Um, if you ask somebody, how did it prepare your critical thinking skills, as we just discussed 
Different people have different ideas about what critical thinking skills are, and I'm not sure that employers necessarily think the same thing as an academic in a classroom. However, um, we have those questions. We have a few questions in the student experience survey. We have none in the graduate outcome survey. They were taken out in 2020. It was mainly due to the um, issues around survey drop-off because the graduate outcome survey is bigger than Ben-Hur. It's based on the um, ABS labour force survey and I think they never met a question they didn't like. So it, it churns through. It, it really does. It's got a lot of churn. And the students are wanting to tell us about their course and their outcomes. And we're going, did you get a job? What sort of job? How much did you get paid in your first job? How much did you get paid in your second job? How much was that a week? And by the time they get to the meaty stuff, you've, you've got to be keen to be getting through that. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you what the employer said. And for the employers that do, and so we get about 45% of the employer names that we get, but only about 10% of students give it to us. That's on a good day. So where our problem lies is we say to students, can you give us the contact details of your direct supervisor? We want to survey them. And they all go, oh, that feels like an appraisal. I'm not comfortable. And, they, and there's soft refusal um, often where they don't do it. We, we work hard to engage them. We ring them. We convince them. We send them information. Um, but it's a hard ask. So it is skewed. It's skewed to students who are comfortable in their jobs. It tends to be mostly postgrad coursework. We get about 3,500 employer um, responses. It's a bit overrepresented in nursing, teaching, health, those sorts of areas, and engineering. But those employers give higher scores for student skill levels than the students do themselves. They also say that the students are very well prepared for their jobs particularly around um, engineering and those sorts of areas, less so in things like creative arts because they tend to be a slower burn in getting into jobs where they're using the skills and knowledge from their actual programs. Um, but you see 84.1% said they were satisfied with graduates. That question actually asks them, all, all things being equal, would you employ the same student from the same course from the same institution again? And that's, um, that's what we get back. So in terms of, I'll squint at my screen, um, the sorts of skills that employers are saying, it's the domain specific skills they're quite happy with. Um, and we get that from the comments. Um, foundation skills, each of these has a number of sub questions, like they're massive, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, but all of those are really high, 93% of, um, employers said that their students had good foundation skills from a, from a statistical scale. So those are pretty good. Technical skills, 92.7%. It's not bad. So where are our problems? As I say, I don't know, because we no longer collect it from the Graduate Outcome Survey. We've kept them in the Graduate Outcome Survey longitudinal for this year because I figured it wasn't good to get rid of everything. Um, and so I think I've been talking to the department. We really need to be looking at a set of skills questions that we ask our graduates, that we also ask our current students, and we also ask our employers a consistent set of questions so that we can benchmark this and see how well we are actually skilling up our students. With all the talk about AI that we've been having today, really we've they're skills that are developing and developing quickly that maybe we aren't asking for, because we're still asked about spoken communication, written communication, I don't know, working in a team. Very generic, critical thinking skills, uh, analytical skills, skills that unless they've, questions that unless they've got those skills they can barely answer, because in academic speak. So really as a sector we need to come together and decide what are the skills that are fundamental to a higher education qualification, that we need checkpoints at those different levels, current students, recent graduates, three years down the track, and um, employers. So we've got some line up. Um, all of that said, yes, going to my next slide. Just to, to build on what David was talking about, what 
industries do our students go into? Uh, industry is not all that helpful because you could be working in mining as an accountant or you could be working in the health, you know, in a hospital as an IT person. But healthcare and social assistance and professional scientific and technical services are the two main industries that our graduates are going into. It lines up pretty much perfectly with what David was talking about. I'm going to turn my head. I've got, I've got a little, not a disclaimer, at the bottom. What are professional scientific and technical services? It's like everything. So it's, uh, read my thing, legal and accounting services, architectural engineering and technical services, computer system design and related services, management, it's everything. So <laughs> there's a lot in there. Um, you have all this data. We give it to you from the quilt surveys. You can look at industry of occupation. You can look at the actual employers where your students are. You can look at what jobs they're doing. You can look at their occupations. Um, the other thing to keep in mind are the number of students going on to further full-time study. So when are they finished? So we, we survey them at the end of an undergrad qual, but some of them are going on to their postgrad coursework. They're not done. And so sort of we're surveying them a bit half cooked. However, they are still in the labour market and the government are interested to see what jobs they're going into and what they're, what they're actually doing. But in our own heads, it, is that the outcome we're looking for? Should we be separating these two out? Should we just be looking at students who have finished, in inverted commas, as far as we can tell, so maybe have completed their qualification and not in further full-time study, to see if they've actually should be out there looking for a role commensurate with the qualification that they've completed? So it's worth keeping in mind further full-time employment rates. Science and mathematics, a couple of years ago, had a further full-time employment rate of nearly 48% or something. It was enormous. It was mainly in the biological sciences, and the word on the street was they were students who were using it as a backdoor into medicine. So they weren't finished. They weren't even looking for a job in biological sciences. They were looking to get into a medical degree. So you need that nuance, and you need to be thinking about that when assessing how, in inverted commas, good the job outcomes are for your students. Um, the good news is that graduates tend to report that they were well prepared for the job that they are in. So were they well or very well prepared for their job? The job that they're in does enter into that because they might have a job as a barista and go, nah, my higher ed course didn't really prepare me well. I'm a barista job. Barrister job, yes. Barista job, no. So we've got that. But it's very high and, in fact, international students are reporting that they feel better prepared for their current job than domestic students. So that's a good news story. But how can we use this data to really help ourselves? Because it does have a, a, it is different depending on the job. So we did a bit of work um, for the department, another area of the department, where we looked at people who were in teaching jobs in the, in the graduate outcome survey or the graduate outcome survey longitudinal. And we looked at those who said they were prepared or well prepared or not prepared for their current job, which is a job you would line up with teaching, let's face it. And then we did a content analysis because we asked the students, what did your institution do well to prepare you and what could they have done better? We did a content analysis of that and it came up with things like what, more um, placement, more um, information about um, classroom management, what more. There, there was a lot of that, that talk. And we fed that back to the department as part, part of that teaching review. I would strongly recommend you do that with your own data that we give you. Look at the student comments around preparedness. Take some specific occupations, because you can see what faculty they've come from. And you can say, we're training, or our students are becoming, I don't know, managers, let's say managers. Um, and they're doing our management course, and they're saying they're not getting this stuff, or they are getting this, or we should be doing more of that. This is the student voice. This is about a way that you can get information and insight from your students about how to design your curriculum, what content you might be needing to put in there, and different delivery styles or methodologies that you might employ. So I think there's, there's some power in, in some of these things. Um, occupations, just gonna jump in here. Sorry about the slide. You'll have these slides. You can go and immerse yourself in this one. 
What it shows you in the short, in the short sort of crib notes, International students are much less likely to be working in managerial or professional occupations than domestic students. So even when they do find a job, and this is for full-time employment, even when they do get a full-time job, they're not working in professional and managerial occupations. And for postgraduate coursework international students, that's even worse. You can see from this, that's a very little, they're quite small red areas at the top there. So what we're seeing there is that the kinds of jobs that our international graduates are getting are not, well, it's inverted commas, quality jobs. They're not accessing work at what we would consider a level commensurate with a higher education qualification. So what sort of jobs are our graduates getting? So this is, I think, all graduates. So I've just chucked them all into one big pile. Just to show you the sort of detail you can get. We put ASCED code level, because occupations are ASCED, ANSCO code, sorry, um, and we give it to you at the broad occupation, so just at professional managerial, but we also give it to you at two, three, and four, so you can dig into levels of detail. If, if you go to four, it's like one person in each job, it's almost like a, you know. But you can, you can aggregate these up, and so for the whole sector, midwifery and nursing professionals make the biggest occupation group that come out of higher ed in 2022. School teachers are another big one and we're looking at um, about four and a half thousand in those big groups and they get smaller from there. So again, you have a word cloud. We give you all of this information in your institutions that you can interrogate. Um, we can also look, for example, at those international graduates working in other occupations. They're working as sales assistants, store persons, food preparation assistants, and, and my Uber drivers. I don't know how I attract them, but they like to tell me about their courses at some length. Um, so all of this is available to you. We also have another set of questions called the scale of perceived overqualification, where you can see uh, students saying whether someone with less skills than them could do the same job. And you see that it's, it's higher for the less um, vocational areas than the than the others. I've got too many slides again. Um, we also see that when they aren't using their uh, qualifications, so they're in jobs which aren't using their skills, there's a distressingly large number who saying not enough work experience. So if they're part working part-time, it tends to be because they're studying, that they're, not, they're working as a barista, um, but they're also saying not enough work experience. Same with employed full-time. You can see it's mainly that they're doing an entry-level job, doing that to prepare themselves for their for whatever occupation they're aiming at, but also they're saying not enough work experience. But then a lot of them are saying, I'm satisfied with my current job. It's a successful outcome, isn't it? Um, and then I'm just going to jump through these because I'm running out of time. So what to do about all of this? What are your students' goals? Have you asked them, do you know what their career goals or their, their goals are after their course? Um, profile management, so what David was talking about. You need to be looking at those skills, um, skills documents, the, what are they called, the industry training plans that we used to look at in TAFE. You need to do environmental scanning, because if you're pumping out three and a half million people without the skill sets they need for the current labour market or your current location where your students are located, you're probably not doing them a service. Careers education and support, particularly um, for language and the ability to access the labour market, international students are having trouble accessing the labour market. Um, part of that is, is lack of professional networks, part of that may be um, things to do with language proficiency and confidence, some of it may be to do with discriminatory hiring practices in the labour market. And there may be a piece of work there to um, educate employers about student visas and things like that. There are a range of other things, work integrated learning, practical placements, applied learning, uh, employability skills development, and also, as a sideline, support for students who are studying full-time and also trying to work full-time. So there are a range of things here, even though the labour market is the thing that moves those full-time employment rates more than anything we're doing directly, these are things that will help your students make the best fist of it when they get out there. 
So that was, I'm, I'm ignoring that question. Sorry. Only left us two minutes. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa's left enough time for maybe two questions. I'm sure that might be a strategy, but we'll see. Okay, so we don't have any questions for Lisa. Okay, thank you. Up the back. Hi. Um my name's Lee Wa Fan. I'm from the University of Southern Queensland. I'm the director of Academic Quality Unit. What you presented today and what you've talked about and what was presented yesterday at the international session as well, um, I found that the sectors got a lot of data and were surveying students a lot. Can you tell us how, as a sector, we can minimise the, uh, sorry, the survey burden for students? International students are particularly surveyed. We love surveying them. Um, my, my, this is contentious. Our sector is very good at collecting information. We're a bit poor at using it, distributing it, getting it to the right people. And so we, we tend to get these projects that, that someone very worthy comes up with. Um, and we've seen a number of surveys coming out of the department, Austrade, a number of those areas which actually are collecting very similar stuff to what the quilt data is collecting. And that's because we're not making enough breakthrough with the quilt data. A lot of institutions don't know what they have. Those graduate outcome surveys, the SES, that is a wealth of the most useful information, but people are not mining it, they're not using it. And so they think, oh, we need information about graduate outcomes for international students design another survey. And so we collect it uh, at four to six months. We collect it again three years later. There's some really interesting stuff, occupations, industry of employment, um, stuff about the satisfaction with the course. There's stuff around um, uh, that preparedness item. There's, there's the, the students' comments are all in there and we give it all back to the sector. It is completely transparent. You get everything back. The problem is it doesn't get to the right people, I think, to use it, and so we just collect it again. So I think there's a piece of work here for the whole sector to try and consolidate this, and, and when you get a survey for the same thing, maybe point out you've already got this information and you could use it. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more short question. There's someone down the front, if there's a microphone handy. Thank you. Um, Jackie, RMIT, Academic Board again. I'm just curious about COVID impacts, basically. And so, yeah, what do you predict or be concerned to see for future ESS results in the next few years as these graduates who have been going through degrees, who have somewhat hastily moved online due to the nature of COVID, what are you expecting to see in the next few years? You, you, you spoke really quickly, and I reckon I missed three quarters of your question. <laughs> so, yeah, do, can, you, can you run that through me in pieces e, and slow it? Yeah, the ESS survey in future yes. years with like, what are you expecting or predicting or concerned to see from future employers with these graduates going through who learnt mostly during COVID times? I think where there are a lot of questions in that, in that ESS survey, in each of those little packets, there's about eight questions underlying that. And I don't know that we're asking the right questions. I mean, what, what regardless of technology, what are the skills that students need to be coming out of a higher education qualification with that employer's value. There's also the capacity within Quilt to be asking specific questions around skills for specific um, occupational areas. So in, in uh, where we have um, uh, professional accreditation processes, psychology, accounting, engineering, we could be asking some of those skills questions to help institutions with those, those accreditation processes. There are different questions we should maybe be asking people going into health professions. There are different questions. So I think there is potential in the ESS and all of the other surveys to be asking the right skills questions so that we can, we can monitor how we're going. The employers currently that we do get are, are very satisfied with the skills um, of students. Uh, for example, I can see in that data that students who studied completely online, 
less likely to have developed spoken communication and working with other skills. We see it in the graduate survey when we had them. We see it in the, the longitudinal one three years later, it's still lower, and we see it with the employers. So there's, a, there's interesting things that we can gather about the methodologies that we use to teach students and where we're perhaps having a negative impact on, on the sorts of skills they develop through those, through those delivery mechanisms. So I think, I think there's a piece of work for the sector in the next year or two um, once things settle down, um, to talk about what skills do we need and to work with Jobs and Skills Australia and the Department of Education to get the right set across all of the surveys so that we can monitor this and feed back to institutions about what they might need to improve. Okay, thank you very much. Can you all join me and thank Lisa for her <laughs> insane talk? I'd now like to welcome Professor Marnie Hughes-Warrington, AO, Standing Acting Vice-Chancellor. And as Marnie says, that means the only, only part-time Australian Vice-Chancellor. And her other full-time job is Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Enterprise, University of South Australia. Marnie will deliver our closing keynote, Higher Education Looking Forward. Thank you, Marnie. So I want to thank Lisa for, in that last session, describing me simultaneously. I'm a first-in-family philosopher, so I've now discovered that I'm both diabolical and a slow burn, which means that I could be a pain in the neck until I peak at the age of 95, Lisa. So um, you need a, a really long goss when that comes like 40 years after the survey and says, how much of a pain have you been in your career? And hopefully there'll be some thoughts in here. I have one of those professions where, as a first in family, and any students out there, you may sympathise with this, explaining to your family what it is you do exactly. Right? I am a philosopher. My mum says, explain it to me in a way that I can explain to my quilting buddies. Okay? Right, how do I explain it to my quilting buddies? I'm actually what you call a metaphysician or a systems philosopher. I'm interested in why there are things like left and right. Pretty basic, right? Do you need a left and right in the world? Do you need an empty and a full in the world? And my mum says, we already have those things. Stop <laughs> thinking about it, OK? <laughs> the point is, sometimes these skills are actually really, really useful skills because you find yourself in a context where they might actually be really interesting to ask, what's the system that we're in? What are the rules that we have? And are they written rules? Are they unwritten rules? And how do they help us or how do they hinder us? Now, I work on histories which is also a bit of a slow burn, isn't it, really? One of those slow burn professions. And I'm interested in histories because they're not just about the past, they're actually mostly about the future, if you read them, interestingly enough. And I'm particularly interested, and my eye was caught a few years ago, people said to me, oh gosh, you know, how long have we got in the age of AI? You always ask an historian, right? So 2020, people said to me, oh, how long is the pandemic going to go on for? And I said, oh, about eight years. I discovered that was not a really very good answer to give people. They were expecting six months, three months, it'll be okay. Not a very optimistic answer. So when people say to me, how long have we got AI with AI? I go, oh, about five years ago. Okay? Again, not a helpful answer. The reason I'm interested and I've answered about five years ago, because in 2016, this robot called Todai Robot actually passed the entrance exam for Tokyo University. So you've had a panel on AI and assessment today. I'm sorry, it's already happened. This robot was admitted to the University of Tokyo, and not just with multiple choice answers, but Todai Robot actually wrote a 600-word essay, a history essay. Right? So this assumption that particular professions or forms of knowledge are more susceptible to AI than others, it's a bit of a shock when you discover that this thing wrote an essay, 600 words, on actually maritime trade in the 17th century, which most of us would actually, frankly, struggle to do. But it did that. Now, what I could do as an historian is get very shocked by that and say, OK, how did this particular robot do that? How do I prevent that robot from doing that? Or I can step back and I can take a systems approach to that. And I go, how did that robot manage to do that? What was the system that enabled that to happen? And it's an, actually an important question, not only because histories bring comfort to people or they're really entertaining in the case of you know, some of those pictures that you see, those films, 
but actually people also use history or in the name of history to hurt one another. So a lot of the political conflicts that we're learning about right now are actually driven by people claiming things about one another historically. But they're also important because they're descriptions about the future as well. So if we think about the system that a robot, that enables a robot to pass, I'm really interested to know, well, how could we generate more of these things and how many of them could be malicious? And if they are, how could I spot them? So could I use my system skill to tell the difference between a human historian and a robot historian, and could that be helpful for ethics? Well, the kind of system that enables that, I've been looking at books written by humans and comparing the logic that they use, that robots use, to figure out, can you spot the difference between these two? Well, interestingly enough, the system is the really important thing here. The reason why Toto Robot actually passed the entrance exam is because there's a small number of mandated history texts in Japan, right? There's three state-sponsored history texts. That's breakfast for a robot, right? That's a small language model. Pretty easy, okay? So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is when you see AI happening or changes happening, is there a dependency that we can spot in there? So there's a bit of a weakness, not just because the state might have mandated history books, but because the state might ban history books or because the people that are teaching history work in schools or universities or higher ed institutions, they can't afford history books. Or because we're all using online platforms that only recommend through history books. Right? So sometimes we find ourselves in a smaller system with constraints because of poverty, because of political decisions, and sometimes because of platform decisions. The second thing we find, interestingly enough, is when we ask ourselves how do these things happen, is there a misalignment going on there between really fantastic histories that are written by historians whom we presume are human, though these are books and I've never met them so I'm not sure. These are fantastic histories, difference between that and the way in which most people learn history which is by watching films. So there's a misalignment between the skills that we're teaching people in history and the way in which people are coming to history, which means that we might not be getting the breakthrough in the knowledge, some of the skills misalignment that you've just talked about. The third thing is maybe we're just not good in designing systems in which the if, but, perhaps, maybe of the historian is actually well reflected. There's a lack of ambiguity in some of the structures that we produce in computer science, which can iron out some of the hesitation of historians. And then finally, there's some things, some, some tricky things where we might assume that, the peop that books are written by humans. We might be presuming that we're dealing with humans and that assumption could be holding us back. But in all of that, if you ask people, do you trust a history, most people say, I don't. So while we can look at the systems that generate robot historians that might produce malicious history texts that we could be worried about, most of the time people have a not good feeling about these things anyway. And you probably do too every time you go and look at what Chatty G has produced. And I've been told by my son that it's not ChatGPT, it's Chatty G, because we live in Australia. And in fact, in Victoria, you'd just call it the big G, wouldn't you? <laughs> the big G. If you type, you know, you ask Chatty G to write a history essay, Chatty G produces a tone and you read it and you go, that doesn't look like a history essay. Why not? Because Chatty G's primary corpus is 113 unpublished romance and science fiction novels. <laughs> That's all you need to know, okay? So if you're teaching a science fiction course, this tool is the best thing that's ever been invented for you. You need to use it. So, Let's take some of the learnings around stepping out from saying there's a machine, I'm worried about it, it passed the exam, what do I need to do to support it, should it graduate, does it get a testema, to the big system that made that possible. And let's look at a couple of other examples. So when we do that, let's ask the basic question, if there are big trends in higher education, like the systems questions I've just raised there, what are they? Well, I think the big thing is, that we have to move our mindset away from thinking that regulation is just about law, L-A-W, to thinking about big networks, big systems, and L-O-R-E, and I'll come to that one at the end. Or as my grandma would say, if you have to wait to be told to do something, you're in big trouble, right? That's the bottom line for regulation. If you need something to be stated in law, 
no offence lawyers, it might be too late. Right? So let's take some examples of that. The first is, oh, I'll press hard. The robots are rebelling. Okay. <laughs> the first is, let's take a look at that AI example there. Okay? So here we have the number of global cyber attacks. What's the biggest one up the top? Which is the sector at the top? Higher education. Soft target, okay. Very few cybersecurity professionals, so we have a dependency on a small number of people, we have a large surface area, or as national security folk like to say, we love giving stuff away for free, and we like being flattered. Okay, so we're the world's best fishing opportunity, if you can think about it. We're a big risk. We're a massive risk, okay? And then we also have, you know, views on how we're dealing with contract cheating. How are we going about doing that? It's really complex. You're going out on the open market. How are you going to keep up with that? When we look at these things, we, f we figure that we're not just thinking about one cyber attack. Actually, on average, we are, our teams are dealing with probably a hundred or a couple of hundred attempted attacks per week. We're going to have to scale up our thinking and go beyond the law, which might not be keeping pace with this, to think about how we reframe what we're dealing with and take positive advantage of it. So here's an example where AI is actually being really helpful at the moment. It's being used by journal article editors to actually spot deep fakes in pictures. So to spot fake research results and that's now being rolled out pretty, pretty well. It's not just about spotting students writing the wrong essays, it's actually about spotting journal articles that potentially could lead to dangerous health interventions. Okay, so that's pretty useful. But it's not a, a, a new problem. AI is actually just part of a very, very old problem, which is when you start writing things down, you have a different relationship to the information to when you present something live. And Ever since we started writing things down, we've been getting engaged in this lots of Turing tests. We've been passing paper back and forward one another for over 2,000 years. So we've actually had an awful lot of practice figuring out when something's good and when something's not good because people have been writing fakes for a long time. Okay? So it's not just that robots, regulatory robots, can help us to spot fakes. We actually do have a deep history of thinking about how we can spot a fake because we've been doing this for a long, long while. Having said that, that makes us susceptible to having texts that are not produced by humans. That's a particular challenge we face right now. It's not a challenge, I have to say, for instance, for Aboriginal historians because they present their histories live. So I'll come back to that. Let's go to a second particular challenge. Here are insurance claims. All right, so we've got a world where you've got hundreds of cyber attacks happening all the time. You've got robots that might be helping you out in regulatory ways, but at the same time, we're seeing an increase in the number of insurance claims. If you have to wait, you're going to be in trouble because your insurance premiums are going to, premiums are going to go up. You're really going to find yourself in an extreme environment. So let's give ourselves some examples here. UQ, Southern Cross, Shout out to them in Lismore. They, for instance, took over a lot of the social services in Lismore. That's a really impressive example, by the way. UTAS just shows you you can be flooded. I'm from Tasmania. You can be flooded in Tasmania. Look at that. And my favourite and worst and favourite construction project at ANU, which I was responsible for, that's what happened when it got flooded. Look at that. Okay? This is happening increasingly. Okay, so we have got hundreds of cyber attacks a week. We have an increasing number of flood events. But if you look at the statistics globally, it's actually fire that's accelerating the fastest. Right? Do we have to wait for the law to tell us to what, what to do? Well, no, again, we don't. In the case of II, we've had a long history and people have developed tools that can be used for good. In this case, corporate Australia and students have actually been real leaders. They've shown us that you don't have to wait for policy to tell you what to do. You have a thing called ESG, Environmental Social Corporate Responsibility. Corporate Australia has actually been driving our improvement in environmental reporting. Our improvement in environmental outcomes is coming from corporate Australia, but it's also coming from consumer pressure, and that includes students who are actually driving the change 
without necessarily the legal change. Okay? In the first example with AI, the regulation's not keeping up because it's moving so fast. In the second example, it didn't move fast enough, but that has not stopped positive change. The point here is, again, regulation is not about law, L-A-W. Regulation is actually about figuring out that you're entangled in a globe where cyber attacks are becoming more and more global. It's actually about figuring out that you can do something about environmental change, that you can actually do something about social inclusion and the mitigation of SASH. You can do that. You can do it by being on the front foot and you don't have to be told to do it. You can just do it, okay? So that's the second example. Now I'm told I'm diabolical and I'm a slow burn, so I'm gonna now come to the most provocative. Because the first two you're expecting them to say, climate change, AI, all right. We're gonna now talk about vertical integration. Hopefully there's some marketing students out there who will get this one. Here's the most provocative idea. <clears throat> This one's confronting us right now. What's a vertical integration? That's where a company acquires capability all the way down a supply, right? So it could be if you're a farmer, you grow the product, you harvest the product, you turn it into a food material, you then have a supermarket, you sell it. That's a horizontal vertigra integration. The world we're living in is more about vertical integrations, where companies like Amazon, who originally started by selling books to you and me, and I love books, so I have a warm feeling about this, then moved into the big data management business, then moved into the supermarket business, then moved into the credit business. They have, through clever acquisition and a lot of mistakes, winkled their way into your life so that they are now more omnipresent than they ever were before. So if you've got Alexa in your home, you've got Amazon in your home. If you're addicted to buying books, which I am, another vice that academics have, Amazon is in your life. If you like buying online shopping, they're in your life. Chances are the data that you're using in your private internet is based on Amazon. They have acquired all of these things and you have become more dependent upon them. And that dependency may drive your behavior in particular ways. That's an interesting vertical integration. And that's the example most people talk about when they talk about vertical integration, they look at technology companies. But let's look at another one on the right hand side of the slide. Did you realize that we might be becoming part of, if not already, the vertical integration of some marketing companies. QS times higher are marketing companies. They started by producing magazines. They discovered after a while that nobody wanted to buy magazines, so they had to find an afterlife. Smart work. They figured out that they could do surveys. They could start collecting data, and because they were good at marketing, they could promote their surveys to you and me and globally. It caught on. It's pretty fabulous, isn't it? So I pleasingly put out a press release yesterday saying our rankings had gone up. Yes, it's a really good feeling to say that your rankings have gone up. When I do that, I'm promoting the marketing of that company. Here's a provocative question. Has Australian higher education or tertiary education become part of the vertical integration of these companies by de facto. I ask the question because I'm a DVC research and possibly the law tells us about research excellence, but the rankings have driven the narrowing down of research excellence to the impact of journal papers, right? And we've gone, oh yes, I'll do that. I write books. I don't quite fit in that picture. Should I change my behavior and conform to that? Or should I wait for these platforms to catch up on me? Which they will. They'll get more and more books in there. But let's think about that. Without law, L-A-W, we found ourselves slipping into a system 
and our very definition of research has slipped in there and got narrower and we found ourselves integrated in to that system. All right? If we go back to the first example, we could find ourselves in a world where we think our world is completely about cyber attacks and malicious use of AI, or we can figure out that we've been in a long history where our relationship with information, we've got deep history and we've got something we can do about it. We can see ourselves as susceptible to extreme weather events or we can actually be on the front foot and we can actually do something about that through the way we govern. We can also do something about this by realising that the definition of research that we have doesn't have to be something that we're given. As my grandma always also said, you can either be the servant of the rules or you can be the maker of them. So what's the moral of the story here? There's a certain set of laws that tell us what to do and how we are as operators and providers, but that leaves an awful lot of decision-making, sometimes the creation of systems where we don't make decisions, we just live with things. And that's the space where we need to catch ourselves out a bit more. And that's where we can reshape our future really more positively. We can think about global networks, information networks, we can think about climate extremes, we can do something about our governance to be on the front foot, and we can also remember where we are. So to round out, I'm going to come to this and say one of the best ways to combat some of the things I've just been talking about is to remember where we are. One of our researchers, Deborah Dank, says, I don't come from Australia, I come with Australia. We could think about the future of higher education as simply as a row of shops. And that row of shops could be in any airport you go to, where they are the same, wherever you go. We could be the WH Smith of the airport world. We could be. Australian higher education could be that. And we should be getting outlets in all those airports everywhere. We could do that. Or we could figure out that there's something else about us that's different. That we're not tidally integrated into a global IT world because we've got that long 60,000 year history. That we are not susceptible entirely to environmental change because we have a long history of people working with this place. And we can also figure out that we don't have to define ourselves by a particular set of rankings because there's another group of people here who've said actually there's law LAW and then there's law L-O-R-E. So here's the most provocative future for us and a challenge for all of you. Could we, might we, ought we within the next 10 years stop crediting Cardinal Newman for the creation of universities? and actually look to ourselves and say that what we have going here is different to everything else on the planet, could redefine what it means to be in higher education. And if we really, truly thought about that, then I think our universities, our technical colleges, the way we think about education could be radically different. We'll have a different relationship with information, a different relationship with environment, and a different way of speaking. So perhaps the biggest future of all is the one where we come face to face with the fact that we've been here, some of us, for 60,000 years and we just haven't figured that out yet. So as my grandma says, you can wait to be told, but if you have to wait to be told, it's already too late. If you look to the threshold standards and you look to the research determination and you expect that to tell you then maybe it's too late. So I challenge to all of you, go and have a look at those pieces of law and tell me whether you can see this in it. And if you can't, maybe the next step for us is not ESG, but it's this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, <John. clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
<clears throat> Thank you, Marnie, for a very provocative and thought-provoking final uh, speech for today. I'm sure you probably all have lots of questions for Marnie, but unfortunately, there are no question time. <laughs> That's right. Um, look, that brings us to the conclusion of our conference. Um, I hope you have a lot of takeaways from today to go back to your institutions for discussion, debate, and even more important, action. There has been a number of topics today that require action by all our institutions. We started the day with Minister Clare, who told us of his vision for a better and fairer education for all, which means we need change, change starting now and change going over a number of years. And we finished with Marnie on her looking forward in higher education. So um, I hope that you take back quite a bit to your institution and we look forward to hearing your progress. Um, that brings us to the end, but first I would like to thank Justine, Carol and the Texa team for organising this fantastic conference. So if you would join me in thanking them. Um, as you were told earlier today, we have quite a number of students here, more than in previous years, which we are very pleased about and hope to continue that that practice. Um, so the students have spoken to us and any students here who would like to mingle with the other students during the drinks, um, that will be organised down near the reception desk. So if you're a student here and would like to meet some of the other students, please, when drinks start, uh, the reception desk is where to go. So once again, thank you. We'd like to in encourage you and invite you to join us for drinks outside in the foyer and we look forward to seeing you all again next year at our eighth annual conference. Thank you.